Hello and welcome to Economic Divide. I'm Kaveh Tahvaib. You know about them in the U.S., but are you familiar with the amount of influence that they wield on lawmakers? What if it affected your drinking water or your children's school or your job? Yes, that's what the actions of lobbyists can do to your life in the U.S. through lawmakers and politicians that they influence. That's the subject of our program. Coming up. There's a steady stream of them every day on the Hill. They got their name because they used to hang out in the lobbies on Capitol Hill waiting for politicians. Yes, lobbyists. And here's a gift to lobbyists. And Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission helped unleash unprecedented amounts of outside spending in the 2010 and 2012 election cycles. That I believe will open the floodgates for special interests. The Citizens United versus Federal Elections Commission court ruling allowed corporations, unions, and cartels to make unlimited donations through political action committees to political campaigns. What the president refers to there when he talks about dark money is basically undisclosed money, money that we don't, um, uh, the origins of which we don't know. What are lobbyists? It's a legal job, by definition, the act of attempting to influence decisions made by officials in the government, most often legislators or members of regulatory agencies. But the extent of it, the money involved, and what politicians and lawmakers do in return, that could run into shady territory, or in some cases, illegal territory. Our first stop, though, covering the basics of what lobbyists are and what they do. There's a steady stream of them every day on the Hill. They got their name because they used to hang out in the lobbies on Capitol Hill waiting for politicians. Yes, lobbyists. By definition, it's a person who tries to influence legislation on behalf of a special interest. This person manages to be paid for doing it, and in America, there is plenty of it going on. In fact, when you look at Washington, while it may appear Congress members are the brains behind the operation, in reality, it's the lobbyists who shape nearly everything on the Hill, from national dialogue to the laws Americans follow. In fact, experts estimate $9 billion is spent every year on lobbying. And if you are a top-notch lobbyist, you will make top dollar in the millions. It is such a lucrative business, there is more than 100,000 people involved. Experts say when it comes to lobbying, there are two major factors access and money. In the United States, it is illegal for Congress members to vote in exchange for campaign contributions, and yet lobbyists manage to skirt the system. All Washington lobbyists give campaign contributions, and those campaign donations often take place behind closed doors. The unspoken negotiation is that the politician will back them up. Perhaps the biggest piece to the puzzle is who are the so-called lobbyists? A watchdog group recently reported that 40% of Congress members who leave office later become lobbyists. President Obama ran his campaign saying he was going to change how Washington works. And yet, when he wanted to push the controversial health care law through, it was lobbyists who got things moving. They wrote a great deal of the law. It is no wonder then why many critics say democracy has its imperfections, where elected officials vote for bills they have never even read, and they vote for words that lobbyists have written. Efforts to regulate lobbying actually date back to 1876, and in 2012, it is still business as usual. Our next stop, a case called Citizens versus the Federal Election Commission, a U.S. constitutional law case dealing with the regulation of campaign spending by organizations. It opened the floodgates of corporation campaign spending in what some have called a ruling that has destroyed more than the voting system, that it has destroyed America. Even the U.S. president has condemned it, although the U.S. public did not buy it, since the president himself has been sponsored by the very same corporations that he is condemning. And the economic impact of the ruling, every state in the U.S. has felt it, from taxes to employee rights. Last week, the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections.
I don't think American elections should be bankrolled by America's most powerful interests, or worse, by foreign entities. They should be decided by the American people. And I'd urge Democrats and Republicans to pass a bill that helps correct some of these problems. It was five years ago that the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission helped unleash unprecedented amounts of outside spending in the 2010 and 2012 election cycles. The case, along with other legal developments, created super PACs, which can accept unlimited contributions from corporations, as well as from individuals. These groups spent more than $600 million in the 2012 election cycle. Demonstrators gathered on the fifth anniversary of Citizens United in front of the New York County Supreme Court on Wednesday before making their way to the New York Stock Exchange, protesting what they call shady political activity by tax-exempt dark money organizations. It would be interesting if there could be a bipartisan effort between Republicans and Democrats uh, to institute campaign finance reform. So it's a really an equal playing field. And actually, if that were true, then we could really have a debate about ideas. Protesters laid out a big mock-up of the board game Monopoly as a display of the, quote, games politicians and big corporations play with money. They are worried that corporations are able to influence candidate selection and policy decisions in upcoming elections, rendering the average voter essentially voiceless. The Citizens United versus Federal Elections Commission court ruling allowed corporations, unions, and cartels to make unlimited donations through political action committees to political campaigns. The Citizens United ruling initially stated, extended to corporations, um, the legal option of donating through political action committees to political campaigns. That was later extended to unions and cartels. So it's not just corporations. It's very much unions and corporations who are benefiting from this ruling, as well as individuals who have more freedom. But they are limited because you have to go through these PACs. You have to hire a lawyer to form a PAC, and most individuals aren't going to bother with that. But there are some PACs out there that are, that are actually freedom political action committees. They're not trying to get money from the government. They're just trying to get government off of people's backs. And they benefit from this ruling as well, and that's a good thing. Well, this Supreme Court decision, uh, Citizens United versus FEC, it's a long ruling, but what it simply stated was that corporations, unions, uh, now had the ability to spend unlimited amounts of money in what are called independent expenditures to influence our elections. Um, it led to the creation of what are called super PACs, which you may have heard of, and to a huge increase in the dominant influence that corporations and billionaires have in our elections and therefore in our democracy. Um, in doing so, it uh, turned away from um, many, many decades of precedent uh, of decisions that the Supreme Court had been made or laws that had been passed that made it clear that our government and we the people have a, an interest in being able to regulate political spending to ensure political equality, to ensure that we have a democracy that's responsive to everyone and that isn't corrupted by the dominant influence of those who have much more money. And the Supreme Court was basically saying that when billionaires and corporations can spend millions and millions of dollars uh, to influence our elections, when most people are maybe only able to muster $100 or $50, that that doesn't create corruption in their view unless it's given directly to candidates, right? And so this led to this independent spending. But we all know that if I'm running for office and somebody's spending tens of millions of dollars on my behalf to help me win election, whether that is directly coordinated with somebody on my staff or not, it's creating a dependence on them and therefore a corruption in our system. Our system was not working right before Citizens United, but now it's moved um, drastically towards a plutocracy. Uh, where uh, rule and power is based on wealth, not based on the votes of people. Um, and we have to uh, fight to change this to bring back a democracy that is one person, one vote, not one dollar, one vote. The primary goal of much of the money that flows through U.S. politics is this, influence. Corporations and industry groups, labor unions, single-issue organizations together, they spend billions of dollars each year to gain access to decision makers and governments, all in an attempt to influence their thinking. And this is what lobbying is all about. Technically speaking, lobbying is a paid activity 
in which special interests hire well-connected professional advocates, often lawyers, to argue for specific legislation and decision-making bodies such as the U.S. Congress. There are many controversies surrounding this business, but it is nonetheless a legal activity based on the Constitution. Lobbying has grown extensively since the 70s, and today at least 12,000 registered lobbyists are active in Washington in what is today known as a modern industry with the speculated annual turnover of $9 billion. And to the same degree, this industry has increasingly become the focus of criticisms by the American public. Criticisms have particularly grown recently over indications that lobbying is already becoming an underground business, given that lobbyists are found to use increasingly sophisticated strategies to obscure their activity. Today, lobbying has specifically become popular to corporations that are suspected of reaping huge benefits as the result of this activity. So Citizens United was decided in 2010. Uh, and we've seen an explosion in how much money total is spent in elections since then. It opened up the floodgates to unlimited spending from corporations and billionaires and unions. Um, but we've seen the greatest increase coming from corporations and billionaires, especially enabling people like uh, Sheldon Adelson, um, a Las Vegas uh, uh, casino billionaire, to spend an unprecedented amount of his own money, almost $150 million uh, in the 2012 election. Um, we haven't seen that before. It's taking us back in some ways to the Gilded Age um, when the tycoons and barons of wealth uh, played this huge outsized role within our politics. In a complex economy such as the United States, the winners in the battle over scarce governmental resources are the ones that use their influence to have rulings that are favorable to their own interests. And this is what the lobbyists are mostly focused on and their targets are, of course, changing a specific legislation. That's the problem with politics today. We don't need an FEC. The Libertarian Party calls for repealing, getting rid of the FEC, and pretty much in most of the laws that are on the books today. The only restrictions that are valid and that do not violate our First Amendment rights to freedom of the press and free speech is to say to those who profit from government, the government unions, the government-funded unions, such as Service Employees International Union, SEIU, they're a major contributor, such as the cartels that get protection from their competitors, and especially those who just get direct subsidies, corporations and government employees, they should be required to sign an agreement when they take that money from the taxpayers that they will not use that money to influence politicians. That's the real dark money in politics today, and it accounts for the overwhelming majority of donations that go into campaign coffers. If we want to have a democracy that, um, in a political life that isn't controlled by billionaires and corporations, we have to overturn um, this decision and others like McCutcheon versus FEC. <laughs> I rise on behalf of the vast majority of the American people who believe that money is not speech, corporations are not people, and our democracy should not be for sale to the highest bidder. Overturn Citizens United. Keep the capital. I rise on behalf of the vast majority of the American people who believe that money is not speech, Corporations are not people, and our democracy should not be for sale to the highest bidder. Overturn Citizens United. Keep the cap. McCutcheon versus FEC, um, Buckley versus Vallejo, that created this um, set of laws that privilege money as political speech and say that money is First Amendment protected political speech. That 
uh, corporations have the rights of, of natural persons, right? Um, and that we, the people, through our representatives in Congress, cannot regulate political spending to ensure that we have a democracy that serves everyone. The right of equal citizen, citizenship, political equality, is being abridged um, by this radical uh, and extreme doctrine saying that corporations and billionaires have a right to spend uh, unlimited amounts of money within our political process to bend it to their will. Um, and we are strong defenders of free speech, but we believe that free speech is being eroded in our society when people are not able to speak unless they have huge amounts of money. And that's, that's the reality that Citizens United has created. The system wasn't working before then. Okay, the corruption of money in politics was already a huge problem, but Citizens United took that to a whole nother level. Um, and right now, I think the reality in our country is that we're not functioning as a democracy. It's a corrupt system of plutocracy within which money rules. That doesn't mean that we don't have many rights and freedoms. That doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of political space in which we can fight to make our democracy better. And that we, it doesn't mean we've lost all the progress that we've made, but it means that we're in a dangerous place where things are going in the wrong direction. And unless we change this, we're not going to be able to ensure uh, justice and freedom and uh, make the American dream real for everyone in our country, but we're also not going to be able to play the positive role in the rest of the world um, that we can, and I believe are called to as a country. Jack Abramoff was a former American lobbyist who was at the center of an extensive corruption investigation that led to his conviction and 21 other people. He charmed politicians with lavish gifts and trips, of course, in return for legislation like, let's say, climate change. Jack Abramoff may be the most notorious and crooked lobbyist of our time. He was at the center of a massive scandal of brazen corruption and influence peddling. As a Republican lobbyist starting in the mid-1990s, he became a master at showering gifts on lawmakers in return for their votes on legislation and tax breaks favorable to his clients. He was so good at it, he took home $20 million a year. It all came crashing down five years ago when Jack Abramoff pled guilty to corrupting public officials, tax evasion, and fraud, and served three and a half years in prison. Now, what's interesting is that when a lawmaker votes for legislation that he or she was bought for, they then turn around and invest in those very same corporations, which then bounce them to those corporations since their money naturally is invested there. There is a litany of very rich individuals in Congress on both sides of the aisle. So both on the Democratic Party and the Republican side of the party, it doesn't matter um, in terms of how much they are engaged in uh, financial uh, lucrative initiatives and investments, and that includes with hedge funds. Um, for example, Nancy Pelosi from California um, gave a lot of money to a particular hedge fund project um, in railways in California and a light rail system in California for a billionaire Tom Strayer because it so happened she also was invested in that billionaire's fund, or perhaps not because exactly of that, but certainly there was a relationship between her um, and the billionaire running the hedge fund. Um, there are other Congress people as well. Mark Warner, um, who is a congressman from Virginia, has substantial holdings in hedge funds. Um, there is also Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut, which is a state that actually houses many, many hedge funds, who has 15 to $30 million of his fortune invested in hedge funds. Um, and the list goes on and on. And so what happens in practice, therefore, is that Congress people who have their money tied up with hedge funds, and, and substantial millions of dollars uh, tied up with hedge funds, don't tend to do things that pass legislation to tame the behaviors of certain hedge funds or to tame the ways in which they get paid. Um, so for example, taxes right now for the fees that hedge funds make to run their hedge funds um, are very, very high, and also they are not taxed as if they were um, income, which they are. They are fees. They are income. But instead of being taxed as income, which is at a higher tax level, they are taxed as capital gains, which is a lower tax than income. That's the kind of thing that neither uh, person on any side of the Democratic or Republican aisle would want to change because their friends are running these hedge funds and their money's invested in these hedge funds. Um, so similar things like that in terms of legislation don't tend to get pushed and hedge funds tend to get away with a lot in terms of lack of transparency in the way in which they get paid um, because a lot of Congress people are actually engaged with them. And who are some of the biggest clients of lobbying corporations? 
big banks were prolific spenders on lobbying. J.P. Morgan Chase has an in-house team of lobbyists who spent $3.3 million in 2010. The American Bankers Association spent $4.6 million on lobbying. An organization representing 100 of the nation's largest financial firms called the Financial Services Roundtable spent heavily as well. A trade group representing hedge funds spent more than $1 million in one quarter trying to influence the government about financial regulations, including an effort to try to change a rule that might demand greater disclosure requirements for funds. Amazon.com spent $450,000 in one quarter lobbying about a possible online sales tax, as well as rules about data protection and privacy. Corporations which sell substantially to the government tend to be active lobbyers. For example, aircraft manufacturer Boeing, which is sizable defense contracts, pours millions into lobbying. And Coca Industries, the second largest privately held company in the U.S., spent more than $20 million on lobbying in 2008 and $12.3 million in 2009. It has heavily contributed to libertarian and conservative think tanks and campaigns. Hi, sir. My name is Lee Fong. I'm hey, with the Lee, Block Free Progress. Hey, I'm just Lee, asking uh, what, what, you're inter- <laughs> what, what you're expecting from the new Congress. Uh, well, uh, cut the hell out of uh, spending and... Uh, and uh, balance the budget and uh, reduce regulations and uh, support business. David Lee here is a good blogger on the left. We're are, glad are to have you. No more interviews. Are, <laughs> just a quick interview. Are, are, you, are you proud of what Americans for Prosperity has achieved this year? In you the bet election? I am. Man, oh man. We're going to do more too in the next couple of years, you know. Uh, what, are you, what are you planning on doing? Uh, what, what are your, well, what are your uh, goals? Well, I just told you what we hope the Congress will do and if he's going to support that. You know? Lee's from Amherst County, Virginia, where my sister and brother-in-law live. He's an old friend. You've been to a bunch of our events. What are you finding today? You tell us what you're finding. I'm speaking to a lot of congressmen, and I'm curious the, to know, the uh, Mr. Koch, are you proud of uh, the Tea Party movement and what they've achieved in the past yeah, year? Yeah, there, there's some uh, uh, extremists there, but uh, the rank and file are just normal people like us. And I admire them. It's, it's probably the best grassroots uprising since uh, uh, 1776, in my opinion. What the president refers to there when he talks about dark money is basically undisclosed money, money that we don't, um, uh, the origins of which we don't know. And we've seen a huge increase of this because it led to the rise of these super PACs, which often get their money from a particular type of nonprofit organization, a 501c4, now called dark money nonprofits often, because they don't have to disclose their donors. In the past, that was good for various reasons, um, but it's been it's being exploited for the purpose of political spending so that a corporation can give a large amount of money to them and then have that organization give it to a super PAC, and so then we don't know the origins of that money. And even the Supreme Court... Uh, conservative majority that made this decision, Citizens United, said at the time of the ruling that they thought disclosure, meaning that people would know where money was coming from, was very important to try to make uh, things work under this ruling. Now, we know that hasn't happened. And um, it's led to a situation where not only is the driving force within our democracy money coming from billionaires and corporations and not everyday people, but oftentimes we don't even know the interests, the individuals, the corporations, where it's coming from, which creates a greater, uh, even greater problem in terms of accountability and understanding what's happening and being an informed um, uh, electorate. What they call dark money is anonymous donations, which in some cases are allowable because of the Citizens United decision. That's the wrong word. Undisclosed donations are perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with an American expressing his right to free speech by donating to a political campaign or freedom of the press, both First Amendment protections under the U.S. Constitution. The real dark money in politics is not anonymous donations. It's donations that come from corporations or unions, or cartels, or individuals who are profiting from government. That is the real dark money in politics. And that predated the Citizens United decision. It's been going on in this country for a long time. What happens is that government employees, government contractors, corporations, unions, and cartels that get protection from government all make donations to political campaigns. And then, in turn, those politicians vote to give them contracts and employment and other benefits. 
That's the real dark money in politics. And that's all for this episode. Your views and comments are truly appreciated. Our links and addresses are below. Looking forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>